So we are now on to the concluding lecture of the course, the lecture 37th. Uh, we have covered uh, many topics or the essentials of iron and steel making and uh, during my last lecture uh, I finished the technical discussion uh, uh, by summing up uh, the casting processes uh, and then you know telling you uh, albeit very briefly uh, about the emerging casting technologies like uh, the thin slab casting uh, as well as uh, strip casting processes. Uh, but still per se is not made uh, even after we have you know converted uh, liquid steel uh, to solid steel. Okay. So, not only the composition and uh, uh, cleanliness are important which we have successfully controlled uh, during the primary as well as the little metallurgy steel making processes. We must understand that microstructure and texture also plays a very important role in terms of determining uh, the final properties as well as the engineering performance of steel based artifacts. In that context uh, you know of uh, rolling uh, then we have uh, uh, particularly coal rolling uh, uh, because those there are some rolling operations which can be carried uh, at or below the recrystallization temperature. So, that is why it is cold rolling. So, rolling is one such operation whereby you know mechanical properties of steel can be affected to a large extent uh, and before rolling we have the reheating operations. Uh, reheating is also very very important uh, reheating soaking rolling galvanizing these are the set of operations uh, you know which are which you call as the downstream or solid state processing operations. Okay. It is only when all these operations following casting are carried then only the final steel is going to be made. So, we have made slabs and blooms they may be staying in the casting yard and they may not be of course, today direct charging methods have been evol are evolving or you know uh, taking uh, gaining importance in steel industry because of obvious thermal economy. It is it does not make sense to you know cool down the bloom and then reheat the bloom so in a subsequent day to uh, you know losing all the heats uh, sensible heats that the billet or the bloom or the slab may contain. So, therefore, you know we have direct charging methods that from the continuous casting strand itself the cut billets etcetera are directly put into the soaking pits uh, prior to rolling. So, all these operations actually form uh, the entire subject of steel making, but per se as far as first course in iron in steel making is concerned the solid state processing operations uh, which where the you know uh, the paradigm is completely different you have to do you know uh, the subject has to be looked at from I mean in, in, in iron and steel making course what we have taught in this uh, you know in the during the last 36 lectures we had a very macroscopic view, but I think to understand all these you know uh, operations uh, one has to take a much more microscopic view and uh, there is a difference in the uh, you know way the subjects are treated and certainly this is not the course where the solid state processing operations um, can also be discussed. So, there are additional courses you know which one needs you know, physical metallurgy of steel for example, uh, is a course uh, which possibly can be you know or a mechanical working of steel which can be studied together and then the entire you know subject knowledge can be synthesized or integrated in order to develop a holistic understanding of the entire gamut of iron and steel making. So, with these words uh, I think I will summarily conclude uh, the discussion of key chapters as far as iron and steel making course is concerned and in this concluding lecture uh, for the next 40 45 minutes uh, I would like to you know address very briefly refractories in steel making refractories are very important for us uh, and uh, they are costly uh, and uh, their performance is very important uh, as far as the quality of steel production is concerned or the mill productivity is concerned. Clean and green steel making which you know many of us are uh, hearing these days uh, because of uh, the environmental constraints uh, that uh, we are a big polluter we got to reduce our you know uh, carbon footprint. So, from that perspective I will talk a little bit about the clean and green steel making and because uh, you know uh, I think uh, the next generation of people studying iron and steel making must know a bit of iron and steel making in India. Although I have 
uh, given you, you know, during the first lecture itself, uh, some sketchy uh, picture uh, of iron and steel making and its evolution in India. So, with these three topics uh, covered during the next 45 minutes or so, uh, I will like to summarily uh, conclude uh, the course. Now, uh, refractories in steel making, uh, it has a slogan that uh, you know, uh, to produce highest quality of steel, you require the highest quality of refractories. Just like the slogan, you know, from sharp mind comes sharp products. So here we say, uh, for best steel, you require the best refractories. But best, best refractories, all the solutions are known to us. That's going to be horrendously expensive. So therefore, a compromise is often necessary. So what we have to understand that what is good and what is not good. Refractories, for example, uh, are consumed in the steel making process, uh, and uh, because we have seen that the you know erosion takes place, uh, degradation of refractories take place, <coughs> the furnaces require relining and so on and so forth. So, refractory consumption is a very important parameter which uh, dictates steel making performance. Indeed, uh, refractory consumption per ton of steel consumption per ton of steel is another important parameter that determines steel making efficiency. And uh, I think about 10 years back, I was doing a survey and I found out that about well 40 kg of refractory used to be consumed, today it is less than 18 kg. So, there has been significant improvement <coughs> last 10 years. In the quality of refractories and our understanding of you know what are the best refractories that can be deployed <coughs> in the steel making industries. Refractory industries, uh, this is dominant industry, not as big as steel, but certainly very big industry. And refractories uh, are used in steel industry, uh, in cement industries extensively because there are kilns. Wherever you have a high temperature uh, furnace, etc., operating in petroleum industries, okay you will find that refractories are being used, but steel is steel industries is the by is by far the best you know or the most uh, what do you call uh, <coughs> important customer of refractories. So, large volume of refractories is being con consumed uh, by the steel industry and you have many top international players like RHI Magnesita, Vesuvius, Calderies, refractories and so on. These are international giants. In India also, we have many very good refractory industries uh, like IFGL, Orient Refractories, uh, then Orissa Cement Limited, etcetera. So, they all produce different kinds of refractories and refractories basically bricks and shapes are the one and number two is isostatic. Tata Krosaki is another. So, these are the two different kinds of products that steel industries use. These bricks, etcetera, are used to line, for example, uh, the vessels, ladles, furnaces, etcetera. And hot uh, isostatically pressed refractories are basically the black refractories, which I have told. These are basically, you know, shrouds, SENs, and dish nozzle, and so on and so forth. In steel making, as I have already indicated, the steel making is a basic process. So, we will not be talking about uh, any acidic refractories per se, and the most important refractories in steel making, the materials that you use uh, are uh, andalusite, bauxite. <coughs> These are the four raw materials that we use basically. 
this gives us and sometimes also a fire clay. This is the major source material for alumina. This is alumina silicate, aluminum silicate. Magnesite gives us MgO and dolomite also gives us MgO. So, fused or sintered dolomites or magnesites are used and from bauxite uh, we get Al2O3 and we must understand that more is the purity of Al2O3 more becomes uh, you know the better becomes the refractory and more becomes the price of it. Pure alumina refractories in lar you know large quantity possibly a steel industry cannot afford uh, given the price available in the market. So, these are basically the raw materials which are used by the various steel industries to churn out aluminum silicate refractories, alumina refractories, uh, MgO uh, and dolomite and we must understand this, this is although I have written MgO they are nevertheless uh, not pure MgO per se okay, they are mixed with some other components. Uh, graphite as carbon is also used carbon and then we have uh, uh, for example, zirconia is used in tundish nozzles. Uh, we have uh, chromites which are used in you remember uh, the tap uh, the holes you know um, uh, what do you call the little wells they are closed with some sand powders chromite sands are those which have non sintered qualities and these are the various kinds of dip and they are very specific for example, I think zirconia they are not good zirconia is not going to be applied in the you know bricks which are made used in tundish they are going to be specifically used for uh, the tundish nozzle chromite sand for the well blocks dolomite and magnesite for the BOF converters okay, uh, and then bauxite uh, possibly in different grades of bauxite or andalusite which is a cheaper you know it has contained some silicates. So, it is a cheaper you know Al 2 O 3 these materials can be used depending on uh, uh, the specific uh, applications in the system. Now, all these refractory materials are abundant in nature and as I said they are processed by many of the steel industries and used uh, you know in diverse levels. For example, we will have carbon uh, magnesite carbon brick and carbon basically is used uh, uh, you know to affect the weightability. So, that the refractory surface really does not get much weighted and today the tendency uh, to produce carbon less uh, refractories are also uh, you know picking up because car presence of carbon really causes many chemical reactions. For example, one such chemical reactions is silica you know with carbon gives rise to silicon suboxide which is in extremely it is a gaseous phase and it is uh, it's extremely reactive and the carbon monoxide and the silicon monoxide gas can react with aluminum which is dissolved in steel. You know, producing this is known to be deposition in SEN has been seen alumina deposition in SEN has been ruled because of the presence of uh, carbon uh, in the refractories okay. carbon reduces silicon and where does this reaction takes place this reaction is all taking place in the. So, you have a refractory okay, SEN refractory within the refractory itself this reaction takes place and then there is a gas film here. Okay silicon suboxide gas is being evolved and once the gas evolves here it is the liquid steel which contains aluminum and this aluminum reacts and this is a solid. So, it has to be nucleated and where it can nucleate here is it can nucleate on the solid walls itself. So, the deposition takes place in accordance with this reactions. So, people are trying to now get dispensed with carbon and trying to find another material okay, which will not give rise to this kind of reactions, but at the same time ensure that uh, metal refractory weightability is uh, you know uh, not prevalent to any significant uh, extent. So, refractories you know better and better quality refractories are being designed okay, having more thermal stability, uh, having uh, more corrosion resistance properties, having more mechanical strengths and thermal spalling resistances etcetera. So, these are ever evolving you know uh, good quality refractory uh, prices of course, are increasing 
and as I have indicated in the steel plant the consumption of refractory is being slide gate plate for example is another example okay you know and the slide gate plate material these days uh, I mean uh, I came to know that the old worn out slide gate plates are being uh, repurchased by the refractory industries in their bid to uh, you know recycle uh, the refractory materials because all materials may not undergo uh, sintering or chemical reactions which are present in the refractory artifacts. So, other developments which have taken are taking place uh, in the refractory industries uh, are basically a designing of smart refractories uh, and those smart refractories basically for example, in a big furnace where you know when it is lined with the refractory and you require uh, periodic maintenance you really do not know which are the areas where uh, you know uh, the refractory really needs some services. Okay. So, the refractories are designed you know to have some uh, sensors uh, such that the refractory is where the thickness of the refractory etcetera uh, goes below a critical level you know it produces some kind of a signal and based on the location of that signal or a receptor you know uh, the signal is picked up and then uh, in one go with a robotic arm that area can be fixed. So, RFID controlled uh, refractories are being designed uh, many in Tandish for example, uh, if you remember that I have said that when in Tandish you have an AC you know shroud okay, that shroud comes like this from the ladle okay, this is the ladle and this distance is a matter of concern because when initially the Tandish is empty then what happens is that there is quite a bit of uh, you know air still mixing in this particular region and that mixing takes place till the shroud tip becomes submerged below molten metal. So, now there are you know new kinds of shrouds with attachments and this is a you know uh, what do you call uh, <coughs> disposable attachments the original shroud will get exposed you know this will get automatically detached for example okay, uh, and break into pieces uh, the moment uh, the shroud tip gets submerged under water uh, under uh, liquid steel. So, many kinds of you know these are all cu actually customer driven that the steel industries want minimal amount of air uh, steel interaction during the initial stage of first tandish filling and as a result of which this solution has been evolved by the refractory industries where uh, you know the refractory cost has to be minimal because it is a disposable it is every hit uh, you will fix it up and then it is going to you know it is it serves its purpose the point and the shroud tip is going to be submerged below uh, the molten uh, metal. So, this kind of art materials are being designed okay, uh, shrouds with artifacts uh, you know RFIDs and intelligent systems are being designed better materials are being uh, uh, evolved through research uh, as well as the refractory industry is trying to you know produce them uh, at a lower price such that uh, the steel industries can afford them and the steel industry in turn you know with better refractories the steel industry is becoming happy that it can reduce uh, the volume of steel which is being produced a volume of uh, refractories which are needed you know to process a uh, part ton of steel. So, many developments are uh, taking place in the premise of the uh, basic refractories and all these they are driven by mostly uh, the refractory uh, industries own R and D. They have huge R and D set up in their plants and uh, they really drive or provide solutions to the steel industries which are you know uh, most contemporary. So, I will now talk about a uh, little bit on clay clean and green steel making and you have seen that in the blast furnace iron making uh, that we require uh, you know coke to produce uh, hot metal and the coke uh, as I have indicated is a 350 kg per ton of hot metal is perhaps the minimum coke rate that is possible. Of course, uh, furnaces do not operate at 350, many plants operate at 6, 600, 550, 500 and so on and so forth. So, there is a huge potential to reduce the coke rate and coke is one of those you know uh, material which contributes to greenhouse gases of which carbon dioxide is a component 
And in the iron industries, so iron and steel industries, particularly in the steel industries, uh, the blast furnace, sinter plant, and coke ovens are by far the three sites where carbon dioxide gas is being directly generated. And if you remember that uh, coke serves here. Uh, in all these cases, uh, in here the coke serves as a fuel, it also serves as a reductant, here also it serves as a fuel as a reductant and in the coke oven process, uh, particularly when the coke is quenched uh, in the normal atmosphere, okay, significant amount of air oxidation takes place and carbon dioxide can uh, get generated. Now, this fuel requirement as you can understand that uh, if you can do energy and material recycling can decrease uh, to a significant extent. Of course, we can make for example, uh, uh, you know for, from 450 kg per ton, tons of hot metal to 350 to 375. So, that is the direction in which steel industries are trying to move. Okay. All sorts of steps are being taken and we have studied many of those. Okay. And in that direction, people are even working with an oxygen blast furnace, which I have, I think, mentioned in one of the lectures. Uh, and all kinds of, you know, uh, efforts are being made to reduce this. Uh, one such effort, which also I have mentioned, is the stack gas injection, for example. Uh, then coal injection into the tuer. Okay, uh, these are some of the steps which uh, people have been taking controlling the indirect to direct reduction ratio. And you will understand that our understand you know uh, discussion uh, with regard to the material and enthalpy balance that if we can beneficiate the iron ore externally okay, and you know if you take we do not charge lean iron ore into the blast furnace. Okay. So, you beneficiate the iron ore and then you know take the iron content around 65, 60 to 65 percent Fe. In that case, what happens is significantly because the gang material is going to be less. The gang material going to be less means the total volume of oxygen to be blown into the furnace is going to be less. And as you know that the denominator is going to be less means the productivity is going to be larger and this I have all discussed in my iron making uh, lectures. So, therefore, externally beneficiated by iron ore will help to drastically reduce the coke rate. So, diverse kind of a you know our objective is to reduce the carbon footprint of the iron and steel industry. Many years back I think uh, uh, it was said that in India when we are not that developed uh, you know that we have uh, more number of uh, fires lit in the house because those days you know 50, 60 years back the iron and steel production was also not so high and people were using the LPG gas was not popular in the kitchen and woods were being used and I think uh, there used to be uh, you know uh, a statement going around that it is possibly uh, the chulas in the villages produce more amount of smoke than the blast furnace itself, but those sort of an argument uh, does not hold good today. Today every effort is to be made and in the, in the iron and steel industry and we have to be competitive with the automobile you know industries. Uh, particularly in terms of the global automobile exhaust, exhaust from aeroplanes etcetera and we have to reduce you know so that uh, we cannot be blamed at the end of the day that we have been the biggest uh, polluter and the destroyer of uh, the ecosystem. So, multi pronged strategy is being taken uh, by the steel iron and steel industry apart from reducing the coke rate all kinds of developments not only just once on several fronts uh, starting from beneficiation to about you know injection of stack gas into the blast furnace everything is taking place mixing of different kinds of charges into the blast furnace okay grades of material that we charge into the blast furnace in terms of limestone iron ore etc all are being really reworked in order to move from left to the right in this context we must also understand that uh, the overall uh, you know uh, the impact of the industry is going to be far more favorable which may not manifest directly in terms of a reduction in coke rate, but if the total specific energy consumption uh, can be reduced 
in that case, uh, you know, uh, we can say that we have, you know, used uh, burnt less fossil fuel uh, in the system, and uh, so therefore there is huge thrust in iron and steel industry today on top of this coke, uh, you know, uh, rate reduction process, which is uh, now on uh, energy and material recycling. In this way, if you remember, I said in the context of blast furnace uh, as well as the arc furnace gas cleaning plants that we have, uh, you know, wet cleaners and the moment we have wet cleaners, uh, we do not have an opportunity to extract the sensible heat from the hot gas. Blast furnace exit gas has a temperature more than 300 degrees centigrade, okay. It is laden with dust and the moment we sprinkle water onto it to capture or to you know trap those dust out or remove those dust, what happens is we lose all the sensible heat and dry dedusting system has been developed, you know, which is giving us now an opportunity to extract at least a part of uh, the sensible heat which is present in the off gases itself. Apart from that, in the steel plants, I think uh, photovoltaic and thermoelectric devices are being now installed. I think during my last lecture itself, I was told you that if you go to a steel industry and look at the you know slab piling yards that you know how many number of hot slabs are cooling there radiating their heat to the environment which is going down the drain and you know if one can uh, capture uh, a part of those uh, heat which has been continuously lost you know significant amount of uh, energy can be energy the slogan is energy saved is energy generated okay similarly you know, we, I have told you that during the tapping process itself, uh, you have about 60 to 70 degree drop in temperature and 60 to 70 degree drop in temperature on a daily basis, a plant producing, you know, uh, having 30, 35 hits a day is in several megawatts, okay. And if you, a part of this can be harnessed and that can, you know, possibly be used to dry run many pumps which would circulate water in the rolling plants, rolling mills or which can at least, you know, feed into the colonies of the steel plants which lie uh, adjacent. So, therefore, there is an enormous amount of thrust which is given, uh, you know, in steel industries in terms of uh, energy recovery processes. No gas which contains any chemical, uh, you know, values uh, like uh, carbon monoxide, etcetera are being left to the surrounding and parallelly uh, carbon di better carbon dioxide, dioxide sequestration techniques are being developed whereby the carbon dioxide can be filtered out effectively, you know, for some other purposes. And on top of this energy recycling, material recycling is also uh, being, you know, carried out. The dust materials, as I have indicated in the blast furnace, are extremely rich material in terms of their, you know, uh, value uh, because they contain good amount of iron ore, uh, iron, good amount of iron, good amount of coke and limestone powders the powder form if they can be compacted and they can be made briquettes and then charged into the furnace we can <coughs> harness uh, this material. I have also talked about the slag recycling, steel making slags for example, okay. They are used in you know clinker, cement clinker making, okay. So, uh, that is why you will see that uh, many steel giants today uh, have the cement industries. JSW was not in cement industry, but ever since uh, this, there is an increasing tendency that you know, of course, you cannot directly charge the steel making slags and make it, you know, uh, cement, but it can be uh, converted. You know, it can be reprocessed with some additions and some techniques, and you know, converted to uh, a cement grade material with suitable additions. And that's why you now see everywhere where you go JSW cement, okay, and where the JSW uses you know a good part of uh, the slag which uh, recycled slag which comes out of the steel making furnace. The slag granulation, the slag itself comes out at 1300, 1400 degrees centigrade from steel making furnaces. Can you harness that heat which is present there in slag and we have seen that the you know slag content in uh, iron and steel making industries can go from 20 to 30 percent of the total amount and you can imagine that how much of energy is getting lost. So, huge amount of thrust is being laid you know in energy and material recycling. With that improvement in strategies 
of reduction in coke rate superior grade material into the blast furnace and I am sure in the next 20 30 years you will see that the carbon footprint of an iron and steel industry because there is a global effort now in Europe in India and in you know China Japan etcetera and you will see that on that particular there needs to be lot to be done here of course, but I am confident that in 20 30 years of time you know we will have significantly more improved carbon footprint as far as uh, the iron steel making processes are concerned. And you can imagine on the other hand if you have you know a arc furnace industry okay, uh, connected with a direct strip casting machine uh, possibly you know you have eliminated the uh, you know uh, what is known as a reheat furnace uh, or a soaking pits which require additional fuel to be burned and as a result of which you know you burn more fossil fuels uh, to supply heat to those furnaces. So, if you have uh, an electric arc furnace where the arc furnace can be run with the electricity generated from a DRI plant okay, or from a corex plant and then you have a continuous iron and steel make a continuous strip casting process you can imagine an extremely you know efficient system whose uh, energy credit perhaps is going to be minimal. So, I think you know we are on correct track if you look at the global efforts uh, you know in different countries and I think uh, tangible solutions are going to emerge uh, and we will not be a burden uh, to the environment in the foreseeable future. Let us go to the last topic now uh, which is iron and steel making in India and with this I will conclude uh, you know the discussion on this uh, particular course. So, production wise uh, Indian iron and steel industry has done quite well and I think we have about 111 uh, million tons of steel produced in the last during the last year uh, and we are the second uh, largest steel producer. Of course, there is an enormous gap between China and India uh, in terms of steel productivity okay, second largest producer we are marginally ahead of. We have still produced in the country. So, in 1947 uh, you know uh, when India got independence I think barely 1 million ton of steel was produced. Uh, when I came to India in 1987 after finishing my PhD abroad and at that time India was producing about 10 million tons of steel and you can see that the rising trajectory and perhaps in the last and it goes something like this and now it has to the target by the ministry is that by 2030 we require roughly 300 million ton and this is here we are about I would say this is a little too much maybe this is this. that was the projection. So, we had something around close to 100 million ton. It is not going grow, growing at a rate that is desirable uh, you know and if you try to see project it you get maybe 150, 150 or at the most 175 million tons not 300 million tons. So, you know a paradigm shift is necessary uh, in order to change the slope. Slope change happens you know in any phenomena slope change happens when there is a change in the paradigm something drastically different has happened and then only the slope will change. Okay. So, the exist the way it is going uh, perhaps will not lead us to 300 ton uh, 300 million tons of steel uh, at the end of uh, 2030 years. So, more aggressive you know land acquisition more aggressive you know convincing of the big entrepreneurs to set up steel plant etcetera, improvement in the steel productivity etcetera uh, are need of the hour so as to reach. And this is very important we need to go here because that will give us something like 200 kg of steel per person okay. per capita steel consumption will go to 200 kg which essentially uh, will mean uh, that you know 
two thirds of the people at least will be able to own a car, a fridge, a washing machine um, and all roads and bridges, houses will be made out of steel. That is what essentially is hidden in this particular value and that is what the government is aiming uh, to improve our uh, life by producing more amount of steel and I have indicated that uh, you know the consumption of steel during my first lecture particularly the consumption of steel is an index, index of the affluency of a society. <coughs> we have steel which is produced in three different sectors very peculiar scenario and that is uh, <coughs> this is I think I would say 1988 or so and this is about 1 million ton. So, the integrated steel mill then we have uh, the special steel or the arc furnace base and we have the induction furnace based. So, integrated this is the blast furnace BOF. I do not mean that they do not have anything else. I have indicated that many steel plants have hybrid steel making technologies. They have blast furnace, they have corex, they have DRIs, they have BOF, they have EOF and they use all these things in combinations depending on you know. Uh, the market scenario. This is roughly about 10 million tons and I have also told you in the class there are about 30 odd plants in India which produces 10 million tons. Induction foreign steel makers produce a huge amount of steel in India maybe about 25 to 30 million tons per year and the balance is produced by the Tata, Jindal, JSPL, NMDC these are the RINL these are the major integrated steel producers in the country. We have very difficult scenario as far as the induction furnace is concerned because induction furnace steel making uh, basically induction furnace as you will know is uh, you know looked at in steel making as a melting unit rather than a refining unit. Uh, but uh, and therefore, induction furnace basically uses what is known as and still scrap. So, you take scrap, you remelt it, then you route that melt liquid steel through a continuous casting machine and uh, you get you know billets etcetera made out of that. But the moment you do not use scrap and you try to use DRI because DRI is now cheaper, then certain amount of refining is going to be necessary because DRI contains impurities. But the induction furnaces basically are lined with traditionally with silica material. This is a very cheap material okay? and the moment you use DRI in an induction furnace okay, you have to drive out because DRI particularly the coal based DRIs are cheap gas based DRIs are not and coal based DRIs from coal you get sulphur etcetera into steel. So, if you want to take out sulphur you have to create a basic environment or a basic slag that we have seen. And if you use a basic slag then what happens is this lining material gets worn out in no time itself and therefore, you do not get you know uh, significant amount of return because you will require frequent amount of relining uh, when you use acidic relining and try to desulphurize the bath. So, therefore, it creates a huge problem. So, if you use if you do not try to you know just refine DRI and melt DRI and then produce steel mix it with scrap then what is the grade of steel that you produce become extremely lousy okay? unless and until you can do there is a good amount of studying going on in the induction furnace because of the inductive current passing through the molten metal. So, huge amount of studying is going on, but that you have not decided to use any you know basic slag because the basic slag is going to corrode the refractory lining and as a result of which you will require frequent amount of frequent uh, relining of the furnace. So, you have taken a shortcut route and the desired consequence is that uh, the steel thus produced uh, becomes extremely bad in terms of its quality. So, this is the government is concerned about this and also uh, you know remelting DRI and taking it uh, too little is not becoming feasible for most of the Indian steel makers particularly the induction furnace steel makers because the size of the furnaces are very small. It has been shown by one of the induction makers, furnace makers that below 10 ton capacity furnace uh, 
uh, induction furnace you know you cannot have a little furnace okay so therefore if you have a two ton induction furnace you cannot install a little furnace that's not good the heat loss is going to be so enormous that you know uh, it will not be profitable to make steel uh, in that kind of a small uh, setup itself so uh, the government is concerned about the quality of steel which is being produced by the induction furnace using the dri and acidic lining so there is a you know there is a thrust area as far as the ministry of steel is concerned and we are trying to evolve a solution whereby you know uh, if, of course if you want to you know sacrifice a little bit of your profit change the lining okay and then uh, the problem gets solved but unless you know those this steel makers are extremely small and so every penny matters for them so they are reluctant to you know spend too much of money for the basic lining it is lining being very cheap so therefore alternative strategies being worked out people are looking at it and eventually you know uh, efforts will be made to produce quality steel in terms of and we cannot also we know that the steel qualities are bad but we cannot really close down these industries uh, noting that they produce bad quality steel uh, because of the simple fact that there is going to be a huge socio economic ramification of closure of such a large number of plants there could be about more than 3000 such plants in india employing god knows how many you know lakhs of people apart from this uh, i would say that uh, as far as uh, sustaining that iron and steel making industry up to a level of 300 million ton is concerned we require a very strong uh, you know culture of uh, research and development on iron and steel making in the country but i think uh, the research and development in iron and steel making in india has been uh, suboptimal okay and uh, it is not done very seriously so even though we may try to you know i mean i mean the developments in india in, in iron and steel making technology has been minimal since independence most of you know uh, the solutions are being brought from the solution providers big steel plant makers okay like uh, your sms simag uh, then daniel etc uh, and of late many of the chinese farms so very few solutions uh, big solutions have evolved indigenously because we have not paid enough uh, attention to the steel making R&D although we know that steel is the backbone of the civilization. Okay? So neither the students are interested in to study steel making, uh, neither steel making is taught properly, not steel making R&D is given much more emphasis. So producing 300 million ton and sustaining it because there is going to be huge global competition the kind of clean steel people produce outside is unimaginable in the Indian context because for example these EAF units none of them have any tangible R&Ds. So they cannot develop products on their own, they cannot develop strategies you know which will produce clean steel and so on and so forth. So it is going to be a formidable task you know to sustain that 300 million ton with the existing kind of steel education and research which is going on in the country and therefore I would say that you know the government has taken many steps the ministry of steel particularly but they have not produced uh, the requisite effect and as a result of which uh, i do not see a very encouraging picture as far as you know the future iron making iron and steel making industries is concerned i only hope that the situation reverses and you know uh, somehow uh, we get at least you know a reasonable task force uh, catering to the need of the steel plants. In house steel plants R&Ds are also far from being satisfactory because most of the steel plants are now trying to tie up with the foreign, you know, with the foreign companies and get solutions. So indigenous efforts are very minimal and we do not also have you know, substantial participation in terms of paper presentation and conference etc. So it comes out very nicely that uh, you know the task force for steel making R&D is you know. Uh, more you know, suboptimal uh, uh, in our country and it is going to go like this uh, for uh, the foreseeable futures. So I think I will stop uh, my you know, uh, discussion at this particular point and I hope this 37 lectures uh, have been useful to you and uh, you have come to know about uh, the essence of iron and steel making and this is just the beginning and I would say that uh, that iron and steel making is now a fairly matured and advanced subject uh, and that you know 90 percent has been scaled and the remaining 10 percent needs to be scaled and that uh, 
last 10 percent is like the you know last leg of journey to Mount Everest, it is very tough and therefore, I see I, I think you know we require here the sharpest mind in order to cross those barriers uh, which have been lying before us for a long long time and we have a lot uh, to do in terms of you know clean and green, green steel making in terms of cleanliness of steel these are unscaled there are frontiers and they are going to dictate uh, you know uh, the future steel making strategies and in that context perhaps uh, you know uh, intelligent minds are going to play uh, an extremely uh, important role. Okay. Thank you very much.